Amen. What a powerful time of worship this morning. Welcome to Journey Church. It's good to see you all this morning. Is it good to be back in a rhythm? I know if you're a student, you might be like, no. But every mother and daddy in the house says amen. It's good to see you guys. Uh, glad to be able to open God's word together with you. Uh, this morning, we're going to be, as you just heard, in Luke chapter 18. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, I will get there quickly. And so, uh, but I want to at least set up a little bit uh, in regards to the series. Uh, we are in a series that we're calling Pathways, and uh, here's kind of basically just the, the gist of it if you weren't here last week. Um, back in April, Kevin preached, and he, he laid out uh, four things that he wanted Journey to be shaped by, uh, to, to kind of tether us close to, to form us and equip us. And those were, he, he said, we need to be a people of the word, a people of prayer, a people on mission, and a people who love their neighbor or love their city. A people of the word, people of prayer, people on mission, and people who love their city. And so we're taking, as we kind of ramp up for fall, we're taking one week for each of those discussions. And so last week we talked about what does it mean to be a people of the word? How can we be a people of the word? And if you weren't here, you would definitely can have a, go back and look at YouTube or Facebook and, and see that. But today we're going to be looking at what does it mean to be a people of prayer? How can we be people with prayer? And, and just to right out of the gate, just to tell you, like, I've got a confession to make. I struggle with prayer. I struggle with prayer. I've been a Christian for 42 years, but... I struggle with prayer, and if, if you're anything like me, I mean, this is not every day, but, but it's not uncommon for me to sit down at my table in the morning, and the uh, house is quiet, open God's Word, look out the window with my nice pour-over cup of coffee, and thank God for the coffee, and thank God for the sunrise that I see, and think, I mean, what's the weather supposed to be today? Pull my phone out, right? Check. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. So I got my phone back in my pocket. All right, let's try to re re recalibrate here, all right? So now, now maybe this time I need to close my eyes. So I close my eyes and think about some of you in this room, maybe that, that have asked for me to pray for you. And I'm praying for you in those moments, and I'm thinking about it. And I think, you know, I'm going to send them a text to let them know that they're on God's mind this morning. So I pull it out. Not that I'm God, if you didn't catch that correlation, um, that God brought them to my mind. And so I might break out my phone and, and send a text. Oh, wait, there's that annoying red icon on Facebook. Let me get rid of that. And five minutes later, and you chuckle because you understand you're with me in that, I, I would think. Like, it's just natural. We, we struggle with prayer. And we struggle for all kinds of reasons. And don't get me wrong, I said I'm 42 and I've been a Christian most of my life. Um, I've seen God grow me in prayer, okay? Like, if, if I look back over my life, I can see how God has grown me in that and that I've I definitely uh, would say that like over the last few years, I've seen growth, but it just feels more often than not, prayer for me is like running a 5K in a pool. Y'all look at me like you don't, know, you don't think I'd run a 5K. I ran a 5K the last time in 2019, by the way. I got third in my age group out of three. Um, <laughs> facts. So, but that's what it feels like. It feels like I'm running a 5K in a pool. Uh, or for maybe for some of you, this might resonate a little bit more. Uh, trying to get myself to pray is like trying to get Terry to back up from the firecracker, <laughs> right? Like, back up, Terry. And he's trying to back up. He can't really get the wheelchair to work until his life is exploding. And that's me a lot. It's like when my life's exploding, that's when I get that thing in gear and I can pray. If you're lost, just YouTube back up Terry later. Why is prayer so hard to maintain? Like, Judge just, made, just mentioned that. Like, we have a moment to pray over our teachers, and it's like, why is it so hard for us just to pray? Why does something like, that seems like conceptually so easy, we struggle with it so much? And I think before we can really understand why it is, I think let's just be honest about some of the things that we would say, this is not why it is. Like, it's not a lack of desire. What's interesting about prayer is that it's not unique to Christianity in and of itself. Uh, there are uh, lots of people in all different kinds of religions, even 
I, I can't remember the statistic now. I saw recently that even like, I want to say 30% of atheists that were, that were uh, polled said that at one point they would actually have said a prayer or tried to reach out to something bigger than themselves. I mean, prayer is not like so foreign to us that we just don't know it. And it's not a lack of desire. I mean, most of us want to pray. Uh, it's where, I mean, I find myself, I'm like the disciples who are like, Jesus teaches us how to pray. Like it's, it's not a lack of desire. So that's, why do we struggle with prayer? It's not a lack of desire. And Lord knows it's not a lack of something to pray about. I mean, at least not for me. Like I have my needs, right? I got my family's needs. We've got our church's needs. We've got the needs of our country and our world. It's not like we're sitting there like, you know, I'd pray, Lord, if I just had something to pray for. Things are just so great. It's not a lack of desire. It's not a lack of things to pray about. And it's probably not a lack of theological understanding in the church. Like what's interesting about, I said, you know, all religions, most religions have some kind of prayer or trying to connect to the divine. What's interesting and unique about Christianity is that we get to pray to God as Father. We know that. We get to speak to God. He speaks to us through his word, but he listens as well. We get to speak back to him. So it's not really that we don't understand the theology of prayer. And I think another reason why we don't pray or why it's not that is it's not a lack of seeing God answer prayer. I think most people in this room have seen God answer prayer. Maybe not always your prayer, but you've seen him answer someone's prayer that you know. I've seen this in my life. I've seen him answer prayers that I've asked my dad and my mom to pray and he answers them or my wife and he answers them or my kids. I've seen him answer my kids' prayers. This all makes sense because last week we discussed that we believe God's word. We want to be people of the word. And therefore, we believe that the witness of scripture says about prayer is that prayer is vital. But not only that, scripture doesn't just teach that prayer is vital. Scripture teaches that prayer is powerful. Jesus teaches that. The New Testament teaches that too. When you look at the way Jesus prayed, how he got away a lot to pray, you look at the way the New Testament church prayed and acts and how you see God do mighty works. James 5.16 even tells us that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Great power. And so we say like we believe the scripture and yet a lot of times if we look at our life, we're like, do we really believe prayer has great power? But why is, so why is prayer so challenging for us? Why do we struggle? I, I feel like, I mean, there's so many different places I could go to preach on prayer. But it's in my heart and in my, in my own life and just assuming that in a lot of ways I'm like you, I thought, you know, one of the things that might be the best to talk about when it comes to a person of prayer and being a people of prayer is probably looking at more what are the hurdles that we face to becoming that. So why is it so challenging? And the thing is, it's a complex question with probably very complex answers. It's probably not just a simple cut and dry deal. For some of you, one of the challenges might be that you just don't really feel like you know how to pray. Like Jesus gave us the model, the Lord's prayer, when the disciples said, teach us how to pray. He, he gave us a model of prayer. But sometimes I think for some of us, that just feels so formal. And we're just like, oh, how do I, do I have to do it like he does? Do I have to say the things he says? Is it okay if I kind of riff a little bit on that? We get caught up a lot of times in the method of prayer or the model of prayer, and we miss the matter of prayer. Those challenges are real. But as I consider my own life and I've had numerous conversations with you and with other Christians over the years, I believe there are some other challenges that, of, to prayer that really resonate with us. And so for many people, it's precisely because we believe prayer is powerful that prayer can actually be discouraging. Why? Because we don't always see our prayers answered. Just, just be real. We don't see prayers answered all the time. And not only that, when we don't see prayers answered, what ends up happening is a lot of times we question the authenticity of our relationship with God like, is he really even hearing me? Does he even care? Or we question his goodness. But I want you to take heart today, brothers and sisters, because I believe Jesus actually addresses these challenges in Luke 18. And he does it by way of two parables that speak about prayer. 
So let's see what he has to say to us as we look at Luke 18. And I think when we do, here's what we're going to notice. We're going to notice challenges before prayer. We're going to notice faith behind prayer and the priest over prayer. So the challenge before prayer, the faith behind prayer, and the priest over prayer. And so as you, as you again, let's, before we jump in though, let's just talk really quick about what exactly is a parable, right? I mean, if you've grown up in the church, you might think you know what a parable is, but not everybody has grown up reading the scriptures. So what is a parable? Craig Blomberg, I felt like had the best kind of succinct uh, definition of this. Here's what he says. A parable is a short metaphorical narrative that highlights aspects of the kingdom of God. So a parable is short, unlike my sermons. It is metaphorical narrative. So therefore, it's a narrative. It's a story, but it's a metaphor. So like the widow and the judge, there's not, he's not probably thinking about a specific widow and judge in this whole scenario. It's a metaphor. It's a, it's a story that we hear that tries to open our minds to realities of the kingdom of God. And we as human beings are created to be drawn into stories. That's why the parables are so powerful, like the prodigal son. We're drawn into these stories. And so that's what they are. So let's look at the first parable in Luke 18, and let's just see what Jesus is telling his disciples and really what he's telling us today through this little short story. Luke 18, starting in verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. We're just going to stop already after the first verse. So it's interesting, you don't always get this in the parables, but in this particular parable, we actually get insight into the purpose of the story from the beginning. Luke lets us in on that. Why is Jesus telling the parable? Why is he telling it? He's telling them so that they will always pray and they will not lose heart. So that they will always pray and not give up. So they will always pray and not be discouraged. So before we even go any further into the parable, does any of this resonate with you? Ever lost heart? Ever been discouraged by prayer? Ever felt like giving up in prayer? Ever had that thought come to your mind to pray for somebody that you've prayed for so many times and you literally think, this is pointless. Why do I keep praying the same thing. I've got an uncle who doesn't profess faith in Christ. I've prayed for him, not every day, but I've prayed for him a lot in my 40 years. Still hasn't come to faith, right? It feels pointless sometimes. Maybe it feels pointless because you're just weary of praying for it. Maybe because you just feel like your prayers are being ignored. Maybe because you think God does hear just doesn't care. Have you ever felt that your prayers just don't seem to be making a difference? And maybe you're weary of praying and you're just ready to give up because the situation you're praying for isn't getting better. Or maybe you're praying for something in your own heart that you don't like and it's not getting better. Maybe because you feel like he just doesn't see your pain or he just doesn't care about the injustice that's going on in your life. If any of that resonates with you, brothers and sisters, this parable is for you. Are you interested in what he has to say? Let's read it together, starting in verse two. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So we have two characters in this little drama. And the first character is a judge. And he's an unjust judge. And we know this because he doesn't fear God and he doesn't respect man. This means the judge is not governed by God's ways. He doesn't submit to the wisdom of God in life. And he also 
doesn't therefore look at the justice of people and feel like he has any sort of overarching person to account to. He's also not controlled by people. He doesn't have any kind of respect for this widow. He does what he, what he sees right in his own eyes. This is an unjust judge. But in the same town, we have the second character, we have a widow. And in this society, widows are about as low as it comes in regards to respect. They were at a severe disadvantage. They were often marginalized by society. This is a very patriarchal culture. And so women were not given some of the same rights even as men, even married, much less widowed. And God looks out for the most vulnerable in society, especially when you read the scriptures. You see that he cares about the orphans and the poor and the widows and the foreigner. And so yet that's, that's the juxtaposition of a man of high power you have a woman of no power, and yet, despite this widow's cultural status, she is bold. She has an adversary, and she goes to the judge on repeat, asking for justice. And she is so persistent that the judge is actually weary and fears she may actually beat him down So he does, if he doesn't respond. So despite his lack of concern for her as a person, the judge rules in her favor just to get her off his back. My six-year-old, if you're a parent in the room, this is probably not so foreign. My six-year-old, even though he's still learning how to read, I feel like he's already read this parable. This week, I bought a can of Pringles. And I came home with him at like 10 a.m. And he's like, I want a Pringle. No. I want a Pringle. No. Went on for like three or four times. And finally, I mean, I literally, I don't do this very often. I literally was like, okay, fine. Geez, just stop asking me for a Pringle. And my wife looks at me, she's like, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> you know how I get there. Like our children often do when they want something, this widow is wearing down the judge and he finally just gives in. And now notice what Jesus teaches the disciples about the story, starting in verse six. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Hmm. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's an interesting finish. Jesus compares God to the unrighteous judge. This is what people call the lesser to greater argument, and Jesus does this a lot, especially in regards to prayer. Earlier on in, the, in Luke, in chapter 11, he talks about prayer. He, he gives a shorter synopsis of the Lord's prayer. And then he says things like, now, parents, which one of you, if your kids ask for a fish, would you go, oh, you want a fish? Here's a snake. You're not gonna do that. Or I need some bread. Oh, great, well, here's a scorpion. You don't do that. And here's what he says in 11.13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Lesser to greater. We are fathers and mothers, but he is even a better father. Why wouldn't he give what we need? And here he's making the lesser to greater argument in Luke 18. He's saying, even if an, unri if an unrighteous and wicked judge will deliver justice upon persistent requests, won't God give justice to his people? Of course he will. And he will do it quickly. Why? Because God isn't an unrighteous judge. He's a righteous judge. And more than that, Jesus tells us to pray to him as father in Luke 11 and in Matthew 6, because when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and follow him, we actually become children of God. He is our father, our father. What a privilege. I mean, this was revolutionary, and it still is, to be able to pray to God as father. But what do we do when our experience doesn't match up with this? Like, how do we respond when we cry out to our heavenly father? When we cry out to him for help, for him to right a wrong, for him to intervene in the life of someone we love or someone that he loves, and we don't get speedy answers like Jesus says, but instead we get hushed silence. 
What do we do when we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, which we're commanded to pray in the Lord's prayer, only to see darkness seem to grow and extrapolate? I believe this is why Jesus has the cryptic question at the end when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will we persevere in prayer with faith that God is our good Father, a righteous judge, and that he's not actually just ignoring us, but that he might be at work behind the scenes in ways that we can't see? I would imagine for most of us in the room today, this hits a little closer to home than we probably care to admit or like. Like literally Garth Brooks is the only one I know that thanks God for unanswered prayers. That was for the people who didn't get back up Terry. (laughs) If you got them both, you are cultured. But seriously, doesn't it hit a little close to home? What are you praying for now that's going unanswered? Anything? Have you asked for God to intervene on your behalf only to see nothing happen? Have you been treated unjustly but feel like God doesn't notice or is just really slow to act? The question for us is this, are you ready to give up on prayer? Honestly, are you ready to give up on prayer or have you given up on prayer? Before we can be a people of prayer, we have to be honest enough about why we lose heart in prayer in the first place. And God sees your heart, you can't hide it from him, but honesty with God is the beginning of healing for our hearts. It's what the Psalms are chock full of, people that are losing heart, but praying through it. So are you losing heart? because it would be natural to. One of the biggest challenges to consistent prayer is weariness of what we're actually praying for and our faith gets rattled a little bit. And here's the deal, it's the good news, Jesus knows this and that's why he tells the parable. He knows that there are gonna be times that we pray and just don't get answers as swift as we like. And so he says, I want you to persist. I want you to badger, I want you to knock and knock and knock and knock. I want you to always pray and not lose heart. But how can we proceed to pray persistently to our Father and not lose heart? How can we do that? Well, Jesus actually brings it up. With challenges before prayer, it's actually the faith behind prayer that makes the difference. But here's the second disconnect in our life, really, because a lot of us lack, it's, a lot of us lack faith, not because we don't know the theology that God is our Father and that He loves us, but it's that the theology has not left our head and landed in our heart. And so when prayers go unanswered for a while, we just question if God hears us or if He cares. And sometimes we question if He loves us. Is He really our Father? Are we really His children? And to some of you, you might be like, this is a, that's a drastic jump, bro. Like, you need a hug. But if prayer is powerful and I've seen God answer other people's prayers, why isn't he answering mine? So for many of us, we stumble into with God really kind of a, it's not you, it's me moment. Like I'm breaking up and I think it's probably me. Probably the reason why you're not answering my prayers. I think it's time we take a break. So notice the next parable that Jesus tells them and notice how he ties it to prayer. Starting in verse nine, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Here's the parable, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. I'm awesome. Sorry, that's not in your translation, but (laughs) verse 13. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, 
This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who, exalt, who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, look at Jesus. Look at why he tells this parable. Some in the audience, verse 9, some in the audience trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And naturally, as we saw in Jonah, when you think that you are righteous on your own, you treat others with contempt. But what does this have to do with prayer? Like it sounds like the story is meant more to kind of shock us into the reality of how righteousness with God and justification actually works. And I would agree, Luke makes clear that that is the main point of the parable. Yet why do you think Luke puts it right here after him saying something about prayer? It seems like in the first parable, the main audience are the disciples. But now it appears that there may be Pharisees in the crowd. And Luke puts this parable right here after the one about being persistent in prayer. It's here for a reason. And what is the difference about the posture of the one who's justified and the posture of the Pharisee? I mean, they're both praying. They're both standing, right? They're both worshiping through prayer, but only one of them gets it. The Pharisee's prayer is all about him, his resume, his deeds, his righteousness. And he draws comparison to the tax collector. He's like, literally in his prayer, he's like, not that guy. He's unaware of his need for grace because he's comparing himself to others. I mean, surely you don't do that, right? I don't do that. I've never looked at someone and thought, gosh, I'm glad I'm not, glad I'm not like them. Never, I would never think something like that. I'm sure you wouldn't either. You probably never felt bad about yourself only to find someone else and be like, could be worse. I could be, you know, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I've got my problems, but at least I'm not, you know, Janice. Sorry if your name's Steve or Janice. Totally random. But like, we've all done this, right? We've all acted like that. Yeah, I got my issues, but could be a lot worse. And yet here's the tax collector fully aware of his need for grace. And what does he say? Be merciful to me, God, a sinner. And Jesus says that he's the one who's justified. He calls out to God for mercy and he gets mercy with grace thrown in because not just mercy, he's justified before God because God is getting a hold of his heart. You see, the posture of the Pharisee is he prays with full hands. Look at my justification, God. Look at me. Look what I can give you. Don't you want to draft me on your team? And the tax collector prays with open hands. I have nothing to offer you, but I'm open-handed, ready to receive mercy if you give it to me. And this is good news. Because in the parable, it was the sinner whose prayer was actually heard and answered. It was the man who had no righteousness to offer God that was heard. And so for us in the room who have come to Jesus in this way, if you've come to Jesus with open hands to receive grace instead of offering your own righteousness, your relationship, brother and sister, is secure. It's secure. Your prayers are heard. You are forgiven. You are justified. And so here's the deal. Being secure in Jesus by faith doesn't, it doesn't explain why your heavenly father has delayed to answer some of your prayers. It doesn't explain it. I'm not trying to say that it does. But what I am saying is that being secure in your justification before God does assure you of one massive truth. He's not delaying because he doesn't love you. That's not it. Let me say that again. When God's not answering your prayers, it's not because he doesn't love you. That's not it. I once heard a pastor, John Piper, who I know has said some things that maybe not everybody agree with, but here's one thing he said I really, really like. He said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life and you might be aware of three of them. 
Wow. We may not always know why he delays. We may not always know why he doesn't intervene as swiftly as we think he should, but if you are in Christ, he loves you and he's up to 9,997 things you have no idea about. And when you come to Jesus with open hands, acknowledging your need for grace, you are justified and you are immediately made a child of God. Your failures are not keeping you from his love. The chasm between Jesus' righteousness and yours is not why you're not getting your prayers answered. So you can breathe. We can feel that freedom to persist in prayer. We're children of God, we are loved. We are his, but prayer is still challenging. So what do we do when we feel ready to give up? Well, I believe the power to persist in prayer is actually all about perspective. Notice the location of these prayers in verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The two men were praying in the temple. Like this is where the worship happens in Israel. This is where the presence of the Lord dwells in the holy of holies in the temple in Jerusalem. So people would go up into the temple to pray. But people were in in the outer courtyards of the temple when they prayed. They couldn't actually come into the presence of God and pray. It's not how it worked. They can only come to his house and pray. And the only ones allowed into the more holy places of the temple were the priests where they offered sacrifices. It was the priest who presided over the temple in those days that Jesus is telling this parable. They functioned as God's representatives to the people and the people's representatives to God. The priests administered sacrifices in the temple and conducted proper temple worship. This is what happens. And then once a year, the high priest one time a year goes into the Holy of Holies where the presence of the Lord dwells among his people to offer one sin for the sac- or one sacrifice for the sins of Israel, the day of atonement. This is the temple and this is the system that is the backdrop of this parable. These prayers offered were not in the presence of God necessarily in the way that they thought about it in the Old Testament, except for the high priest offers one once a year. But what about now? We don't have to go over to Jerusalem and pray. You don't even come to church to pray necessarily. I mean, you may pray while you're here, but you surely will pray at home. You'll pray in your car, you pray wherever. How come? What's changed? How can we be encouraged to pray persistently all the time without ceasing? And how can we actually pray to God as Father? Because we have a greater high priest than they did, Jesus Christ who has made atonement for our sins by his own blood. And he's given us access to God and he now presides over our prayers. Look at what Hebrews chapter seven says. Hebrews 7, 22 through 25. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number, but because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And I love this, verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. Say that again. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Why? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Man, praise God, Jesus guarantees a better covenant. Jesus holds a permanent priesthood because he is our high priest forever. Jesus, able to save us to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him. Jesus always lives to make intercession. You know what that's saying? That he is always praying to the Father for those who draw near to God through him. Look at me, brothers and sisters. (laughs) Do you know Right now, Jesus is praying for you. Did you know that? Like right now, in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, in one way, Jesus is actually praying for you. 
He is the high priest over our prayers. This is what his death and resurrection has secured for us, and it is secure, and you are secure if you approach God in him. Do you see him? Do you see him? Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus, the son of God, who has always been the eternal son, loved by the eternal father who gives us his eternal spirit is our eternal priest and presides over our prayers. No crack in your holiness, no blemish on your righteousness keeps you from him. He saves you to the uttermost. He bought you back and he threw away the receipt. And he is why Hebrews 4 says we can boldly and persistently approach the throne of grace. We can persistently pray to the Father. He is why we can approach him with confidence, with confidence. And they couldn't even pray in the Holy of Holies. And here we can be at the throne of grace with confidence by Jesus. Prayer is speaking to God in the context of a relationship. It's not magic. It's not a method. It's like a good conversation with someone you love. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes you can linger. Sometimes it's more about you, sometimes it's more about them. But either way, when we pray to God through Jesus, we can know that we're being heard because he has saved you to the uttermost, to the uttermost. So we come full circle. What about the unanswered prayers? The things that discourage us? And those are challenging, but Jesus understands. That's why he tells the parable in the first place, right? That's why he tells the parable. Like, I'm telling you this, that you ought to always pray and not lose heart. But as we close, just think about this. What's more impactful? What's more impactful than that story about the widow is that Jesus actually understands what unanswered prayer feels like. You see, no unanswered prayer that you've ever prayed, no unanswered prayer in the history of prayer is more monumental than Jesus' prayer in the garden the night he was betrayed. Alone, sweating in blood, inner turmoil, the Son of God asks his father Good Father, is there any way, is there any way this cup can pass from me? This cup of God's wrath poured out for sin. Is there any way, Lord, that it could pass from me? Brothers and sisters, could there be a more legit prayer for justice? The perfect Son of God the holy and righteous one paying for our sins. And he says, can this cup pass from me? And God is silent. He's silent. And Jesus' prayer goes unanswered. And praise God it did. Because Jesus goes through with it anyway bowing to the predetermined word and will of the triune God, Jesus goes to the cross to bear the weight and penalty of our sin. Why? So that he can intercede for us forever. So that he can save you and me to the uttermost. So that we can actually become a people of prayer in the world as Jesus is praying to the Father in heaven so that he can give us his spirit that cries out in our hearts, Abba, Father, the spirit who helps us pray when we don't know what to say. That's Romans 8. So that we can be his hands and feet about his work until he comes again. You and I will only become, this is what I want to say to finish, you and I we will only become people of prayer who confidently come to the throne of grace of our Father when we see that Jesus is already there at the throne of grace praying for us. It's the only way we'll do it. It's the only way we won't get discouraged. 
the one who understands unanswered prayers is praying for us. And so as we close, just the call to action today. First, like if you're not a follower of Christ, if you would say, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a Christian, I don't think. I wouldn't call myself a disciple of Jesus. Then the, the call to action, like the thing for you to do right now is just to trust in Jesus to save you to the uttermost. No sin or failure in your life is too large. No amount of sin is too great. And nothing that you could offer him, no righteousness of your own is sufficient. But if you were to look at God and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I trust in Jesus to be my righteousness with you to save me to the uttermost. He will do it today. He hears that prayer. And you can go home justified with God. If you would say in the room that you're a follower of Jesus, then I would just ask you to consider this week, what's keeping you from prayer? Because I think, again, we, we all know the theology. I can pray to God as Father. Prayer is powerful. God answers prayer. But what's keeping you from prayer? Are you discouraged in it? And then as you're thinking through that, I would ask you to consider that Jesus has saved you to the uttermost. To every nook and cranny of your heart, he saved you. He's redeeming you. He's restoring you. And if you really believed that, how might that change the way you approach the throne of grace in prayer? How might that add confidence? And how might that increase security in unanswered prayer? The last thing I just would encourage you to do if you're a follower of Christ is to create some kind of rhythm in your life that you could implement on the daily, even if it's two minutes, to be persistent in prayer. And if you want to pray in a more corporate way, we have the prayer team that meets every Sunday at 8 o'clock here at Journey to pray over our services, to pray over our church, our volunteers, to pray over you. Before you came in here today, you've been prayed over by people in our church, every one of you. So maybe jumping in and praying corporately with our team would be good, but wherever you find yourself, just allow the reality that Jesus has saved you to the uttermost, to the very ends, so completely and forever, to draw you in, to draw near to the Father in prayer, that we might be a people of prayer and be about his work. Let's pray and then we'll sing. If you want to come forward as well, there will be our prayer team down here. Of course, you don't have to pray with them. You can pray in your seat. You can pray at the steps. You can pray with somebody down here, whatever you see fit. But let's pray and then let's sing. <clears throat> Our Father, we come to you now. You see all of us. There's nothing we can hide from you. What's so beautiful about grace is you're not even asking us to. You see it all. You see our fears. You see our frustrations with you sometimes that you're not moving like we think you should. You see our lack of faith that you actually do move in power through prayer. And you see that. And instead of shaming us, you, you beckon us. You say, come. Come to me. Talk with me. You invite us in to a relationship with you that goes on forever. And in your sovereignty and in your wisdom for whatever reason you've chosen to work through the prayers of your people 
So I pray, Father, that you would hush the lies of the enemy in our hearts and our minds that we're not worthy to pray, that you don't want us to pray, that we have to clean ourselves up before we pray, that prayer has no power. Would you quiet those lies, Lord Jesus, and would you show us the truth of who you are? And would you let us be encouraged today to seek your face through prayer? We love you. It's for your beautiful name that we lift you up. Amen.